uh, we will be talking about Drupal 8 plugin systems. Um, sure, had some sort of speech to go along with this, but I kind of forgot how, how this is going to go. Um, anyone here using Drupal 8 at all? Just kind of experimenting, looked at the code a little bit? Okay, that's pretty much the extent of what you know, anyone who's looked at Drupal 8. Um, there, there's plenty of stuff to do on it. It's, it's a pretty high alpha, but it's, it's not ready for production since uh, it's very slow and uh, not optimized for a lot of things. But it's, it's there, and it's a great platform to start learning already, so that's great. So if you haven't already met me, uh, my name is uh, Hellier Colorado. Uh, I'm at Hellier at uh, Twitter, GitHub, and Drupal, and a few other places. And uh, so, yeah, uh, my interest in, uh, in the plugin system has been in, since even before Drupal 8. Um, I was very infatuated with C tools and uh, just its mechanics and its extendability above whatever Drupal 7 or even Drupal 6 did. Um, so I fell in love with the idea of plugins and all the benefits from it uh, way back when. And I'm super ecstatic that it's happening now in Drupal 8, a little bit very differently, um, but it's but it's there. So um, yeah, that's what I'll be uh, talking about today. And I mentioned this also on the uh, on the actual proposal uh, session proposal that there's a certain prerequisite here that at least you understand uh, basics of object-oriented programming since uh, it can be kind of overwhelming to try to explain that from the very beginning. So. Uh, even though uh, you know this, it's open to anybody. It's it's exclusively made for nerds, and I mean that for you know the nicest way possible uh, because I uh, I love nerds. But uh, yeah, this is for you. So a quick uh, overview about what we're going to be talking about, um, just so we have an idea and give you guys enough time to walk out in case this doesn't uh, interest you, is uh, I'm going to be explaining plugins from a very abstract idea, um, just to kind of see like what they are, how you could identify them, and uh, just so we all have a visual cue of, you know, when I say plugin, you know exactly what I mean. Um, and then I'll talk about why uh, this is important, why the plugin system itself is a, is, a, is a huge impact in the way you develop and even how you want to extend your own systems. Um, and uh, I'll have to talk about some core concepts uh, before we start looking at some demo code so it makes sense to you. Um, so we'll uh, briefly go over that um, and I'll give you a heads up. I'll be talking about PSR0, uh, dependency injection, uh, service containers, and annotations. Um, this is all a lot of uh, buzzwords, I guess, in, in Drupal 8. And if you haven't uh, learned what those things are yet, you're in for a uh, great surprise because I'll be able to explain them within five minutes or so because uh, they're not complicated at all. Um, I can just water it down and show you the bare essentials. Um, and I'll do a demo on writing a few plugins just so you can get a feel of how, he how easy it is and, uh, and where you could actually start doing some integrations. Um, and this is a fun part, uh, my favorite part, or at least the one that I spent most of the time actually investigating is the internals of the plugin system. Not just how to implement or extend existing stuff, but knowing how the plugin system works uh, from the inside out so you can then implement your own plugin type and manage it and uh, do a lot of cool stuff with that. Um, so towards the end, if we have time, uh, I'll, I'll demo how to create a plugin type and uh, won't be able to get into creating user interfaces for them per se because that actually gets involved with configuration entities um, and plug-in bag and a bunch of other stuff that's very related but still a very broad topic in itself. So I'm going to try to avoid talking about configuration entities as much as possible. Um, so yeah, that's the overview. Uh, so first off, we'll start, uh, what is a plugin? And uh, my definition of a plugin is a discrete class that executes an operation within the context of a given scope as a means to extend Drupal's functionality. So within a small given scope, meaning that you're not writing a huge boatload of code just to do this one operation. It's actually small bits that do a very specific function and it does it well. Um, so it's limited in scope. It's not trying to achieve the whole world by doing some massive operation. It's just doing a small uh, snippet of information. It's not also, it's not assuming too much about the context in which it's being, um, it's being rendered. If you're doing some sort of operation against a node, uh, then you'll have a context of a node, but not assume other things like its taxonomies or its users associated with it or whatever page it's on. So plugins themselves are really small within scope. Um, and I, as I briefly mentioned, it's intended to do just one thing, but to do it well. And this is kind of like a Unix philosophy where you have one utility that does this one operation in which you can then send off to the next utility. Um, and these are all specialized, so there's no leakage of, a, of, of responsibilities. Um, so that is a part of what a plugin is. And also another thing that excites me about plugins is that they are reusable. Um, they're not just one-off implementations that you would say do inside of a theme layer where it's stuck and that implementation can't necessarily be copied on other parts of the site. Um, if it's a plugin, you could actually reuse them in different parts of your site 
Uh, a great example of this would be something like a field formatter. Um, and then also plugins themselves can be instantiated with configurations. So even though you might have a core operation or functionality within a plugin, you can kind of permutate based on like the configurations that you pass into it. So you can really extend the ability of a plugin without having to do too much and also assume too much as well. So uh, to give a uh, context as to where plugins are already existing in Drupal, um, let's kind of scan the interface. And this is a Drupal 8 interface, and uh, it's not too far different from what you're already familiar with. But um, an example of a plugin would be a block. Everything that's listed on the right-hand side right here is a block, um, or is a plugin in itself. Um, so that is a plugin. Uh, also, field types. Uh, when we're creating different ways of storing a field, storing its data, that is defined as a as a plugin. Uh, field widgets themselves, those can be plugins. Field formatters, right? When you're just, you're deciding how a certain piece of data is going to be represented on the screen, those themselves are plugins. Uh, the actions that can be done on a node or on a user or whatever, each one of those is a specific plugin. And this could also be related to, like, say, rules where you have conditions and you have the actions that go along with them. And in core, we have a subset of rules being involved in that, with you know having conditions and 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 the action plugins themselves. So that's baked in now. Uh, image effects, right? All the effects that you apply onto the image, um, those themselves are plugins. And uh, here we also have input formatters or input filters. Uh, not the formatter themselves, that would kind of constitute as being a configuration entity because it's collecting all the configuration that you would set on the plugin itself and storing that as like some sort of exportable. Um, so there's a, a very thin line between what those two things are, but the actual processing part of it, these items themselves, is a plugin. So that gives you a general idea. And so we also have CK editor buttons. So I have a bunch of these just so you get an idea at least of what exactly a plugin is and you understand like, oh, that's that should be a plugin or this should be a plugin if it's not listed here. So you pretty much have uh, plugins everywhere. And this is a diagram coming from a PHP Storm. Uh, where we have all the different uh, plugin types that are extending the the base plugin itself, and uh, views uh, has its I mean since it's object oriented, uh, you know you can have a base view plugin which manages a whole boatload of other ones. So I believe in total views has like 22 or 25 different plugins just on its own. Um, so that gives you some sort of a, an idea of the power behind this uh, this abstraction in which you can branch out and do some pretty creative stuff. So yeah, plugins are everywhere. Um, and the thing is, uh, with all of these items that are not unique to Drupal 8, you've probably already seen them in Drupal 7, obviously. Um, so it's you know somewhat familiar to you. Um, but how these have been implemented in the past have probably been something like a, a hook something info, right? Where you're defining uh, that I have a thing or some sort of extension. Um, so each one of these plugins that I showed prior in Drupal 7, there was like an equivalent for a hook info. Um, essentially what the plugin system is trying to do in AAA is get rid of all of these hook info and uh, implementations. Um, so everything that is associated with a hook info would be within the plugin system itself. Um, so that's, uh, that's something important to, uh, to understand. Um, so yeah, well, I'll talk about the benefits of plugins and why these uh, matter. And even if you're not interested in doing AAA development today, you can still take a lot of these concepts and apply them now in Drupal 7, assuming you've adopted uh, C tools or something that is extendable by nature, such as rules or the entity system or, or, or views. Um, so yeah. Uh, one benefit to this is that the definitions and implementations are all in one single place. And this is with Drupal 8 plugins. As opposed to what you've probably been used to, where you'd have a hook info in one place, and then you have the actual implementation, like a page callback, or just some sort of procedural function being executed, but in a different place altogether. So you have a sort of a disassociation between these two. Um, I don't know if you could consider this kind of a spaghetti code type of deal, where one isn't uh, one item is dependent on another to exist. But in Drupal 8, you can have both of the implementation and the metadata that's defining it together through annotations. And I'll explain what annotations are in a second. Um, but yeah, uh, plugins themselves are lazy loaded, and this is one of the things that really bother me about Drupal 7 module development is that when you have some sort of functionality that you need available globally, you'd have to have it inside your modules directory, or at least have some sort of a way to call it from your modules, well, not the module directory, the module file. Um, and so you would have a lot of logic and functions uh, stashed into the module itself. Uh, you would have to store it inside of memory. 
And even if the page request doesn't require that plugin to execute or that functionality to execute, it was just a thing that you would have to have in Drupal 7. But in Drupal 8, all of these plugins are implemented in an external file, and the system is not aware of them as far as the implementation goes until you actually use them. So um, it's better for resources. Also, code is unified. Um, since I'm assuming you guys are developers, you probably have done stuff like uh, implemented a field type or a field formatter or a field widget. And you might have noticed that to implement one of those things, you'd have to actually invoke several different hooks, uh, like hook field widget info, and then the hook field widget form, and then hook widget validator. And same thing with the field types themselves. You have like five or six different hooks that you'd have to implement just to talk about this one thing. Um, so that's kind of a pain. And even to maintain like multiple hook or multiple field items in a single module, you'd have to have like switch statements inside your, your single hook. So this is kind of a, a, a thing to, to, to not want to tolerate as a developer. But in Drupal 7, or in Drupal 8 rather, all of these hooks that you would typically do are now stashed into a method inside of a class, which is all unified. So your one concept that you're creating, whether it's a fields widget or a format or a type, can all be nested together in a single class. So it's easy to find things. And you see the unity within the code. Um, also, by nature that you know things are object-oriented and we're extending classes, all of your plugins are extendable. And going back into the example with the you know creating field types or field widgets, uh, you can't necessarily borrow the functionality that Drupal or any contrib module is already doing because these were all built with procedural functions. It's very difficult to extend on top of that unless you had some sort of a wrapper function, but then it would still be very messy to implement. Uh, with classes, since they're, you know, these classes and plugins are extending themselves, you can override that class by extending it, and you can override a method saying, I don't want the parent method to be ran at all, or I want to do something different where I'm going to alter whatever the method is doing by running it first and then doing other kind of modifications on top of it, or just completely removing it altogether. So it's kind of like what you're familiar with, any kind of alter hook, but it, it can be used in a much more sophisticated way. And uh, plugins are classes, and uh, in classes you can have interfaces which describe the methods that are available for a class. And previously, uh, if you're not using interfaces at all, it's kind of a, a guess or of some sort of a promise that a method is going to exist on, on a class, but there's no guarantee of it. At least with using interfaces, you can always guarantee that a certain method is going to exist in a plugin. So you have a sense of consistency or uh, you can expect that a method is going to exist on a class that implements an interface. So again, I'm assuming you understand at least the basics of uh, object-oriented. Um, also, since we're using interfaces and we can reliably say that these classes are going to have these methods and it's all used within the same scope, it's pretty safe to say that you can move these plugins around within the same scope because they all kind of operate the same deal. It takes in the same input, it's probably giving you the same output, so these are interchangeable in a sense. Uh, for instance, uh, 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 an image effect, right? It takes in an image, it processes it, and it returns an image, right? And that is you can say the interface that, that you put upon that plugin. So you can swap out all the different image effects because they're all going to give you the same input output. So they're interchangeable in that sense. And uh, also uh, they are reusable. Um, assume you have these plugins baked into a module, but these this module doesn't necessarily have to be project specific. And really this depends on how well you abstract the logic, where you can have this plugin exist in multiple projects. So it's not just tied down to this one particular use case. I'll show you some code and then you'll have the idea. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah. Uh, distinction being that a module holds in all implementation of interacting with Drupal, so all of your hooks, um, all of your schemas, but a plugin is smaller in scope where it's just extending a very specific part of the Drupal system. So a module could contain one or more plugins. Precisely. And it can contain a lot of other stuff too. And modules have a larger, like, so a, a broader responsibility scope. Not everything is implemented as a plugin. No, I'm sorry, what? Not everything is implemented as a plugin. Not everything is implemented as a plugin, but as you saw on the screenshots, a lot of familiar interface components yeah, in case, are. In that case, what does a plugin plug into? It plugs into a system that is defined. So, OK, let's step back. In other words, how is it different from just a class? How is it different from a class? A plugin is implemented as a class. Right, but what makes a plugin a plugin and not just a class? Okay, a plugin is a pl a plugin is a class. 
So the thing is, though, where's the plug-in, which was your original question? Assuming you had some sort of a system that takes in an image and it does stuff with it. That's what the system is supposed to do, the business rules. You can separate or abstract out the responsibilities of that system by saying, hey, I have a class that is responsible only for the processing. And I have a separate class that's responsible for actually writing it to file, right? And I have a separate class that's responsible for collecting the file, right? Each one of those responsibilities can be separated out into a plugin system in which you can have classes that do that responsibility, but those are interchangeable. But overall, you still have a system or a concept in which you are processing a file from beginning to end. Does that make sense? Well, I totally understand what you're saying, except that I don't see how you distinguish between the plugin-ness of a plugin versus just a class that does those responsibilities. Okay. The reason why a class would be considered a plugin is if it uh, implements an interface that you define for a plugin base. Okay. If it's under a certain namespace, right? That's how you define whether a class is a plugin or a class is just so a regular it's class. It's Yeah, all of this is part of building the plugin type. Yes. And part of that interface is to allow it to plug into something, presumably registers or somehow gets them into the system. Exactly, and the registration part is something that I'll walk through when we're defining like the, the internal systems. Correct me if I'm wrong, but plugins are a subset of classes, right? Yeah. I mean, all plugins. All plugins classes. will be classes, yes. But not all classes are plugins. No. So plugins are a subset of classes. Okay. So they're basically a class that defines some find standard interface. Yes, absolutely. Okay. That's me. <laughs> All right, cool. So, um, yeah, benefits of, of using plugins and stuff. And if you wanted to, you can carry this into using Drupal 7's uh, C tools or views or anything that's really class oriented and has some sort of a concept of interfaces. Um, so the core concepts that I'll talk about that are used within Drupal 8, dependency injection, service containers, annotations, and PSR0. We'll get into that right now. Um, so first off, PSR0 um, is a, it's a specification request that says, hey, all of the framework, uh, all the frameworks that sit on top of uh, PHP need to have some sort of a way to understand that we have a standard of auto-loading auto files. Um, PSR0 defines what those rules are. And really, it's only two rules. First off is that you have a fully qualified namespace, um, and it should be formatted in the, in, in the way of like a vendor. So our vendor would be Drupal. And then the namespace, and that could be something like the, uh, the path to a module, or just a module and the type of plugin class that it has. And then finally, just the class name itself. And I'll show an example of this towards the bottom. The second component to this is once you've already defined what your namespace is, your fully qualified namespace, your file structure has to match that namespace. So that way, autoloaders can automatically know where the files exist just based on the, name, the namespace that you have in the class. So here's an example, and uh, that might be a bit too small, and I apologize for that. Um, but in this file, we have the namespace Drupal, my module, plugin, block, my block. Right? That's the fully qualified name saying where this plugin or where this class exists, and also where it exists in the file system, not necessarily just the namespace that we have, because the namespace is just a conceptual thing that's floating around in PHP memory. Um, so you'll see that we're declaring the namespace that we have in code, not just in the comments. So it's Dribble, the vendor, and then the namespace for this plugin, my module, plugin, block. Block is a system, right? And then the class is called my block. Because we have these namespaces, we can have this class be called whatever we want without having to deal with like namespace clashes with other modules. That was the thing that we had to deal with with procedural functions. All of our functions had to be prefixed with the name of the module. So by using this namespace system, we don't have to deal with that. And since we're doing some auto loading, we're basically leveraging that namespace and conventions that we have. Um, if you want to read more about this, there's a link at the bottom, phpfig.org, and they list all the different PSRs, which are PHP specification requests. Supposedly, uh, PSR 4 is going to be out for Google 8. Yep. Supposedly going to be out. Is there any difference at all for functionality? Uh, now with functionality, what you'll notice is inside of every module directory, uh, there is a lib folder. And inside, you have a huge list of nested folders because it's basically it's, it's, com it's compliant to PSR 0. Yeah. So if the namespace is long, your file structures are going to be long yeah. themselves. And that kind of sucks because it's, you know, it's hard to get around now. Yeah. With PSR4, the only twist here is that it will interpret dashes inside of your um, 
or, or, or forward slashes in your namespace, it will interpret those as dashes inside of your file names. Oh, so that means now, instead of having a huge list yeah. of directory like nested in, you can have just like one huge folder, well, not one folder that has a, a long namespace with dash uh, delimiters. Yeah, exactly. So, But at least they're not nested as deeply as possible. So that's the only change you'd have to deal with. But functionally, it's not going to change how you're dealing with namespaces internally. Is it backwards compatible? I don't know. I hope so. <laughs> I don't know. There's a there's an issue. I, I, I just heard about that yesterday. Oh yeah. The module provided um, classes are supposed to use PSR four. So. Yeah, and we could thank the guy who um, wrote the uh, X autoload module. He's been doing all the work for that. So kudos to him. Um, and here's the last part of that slide where it's showing you the correlation between the namespace. So here's the actual file, and then where it actually exists inside of the file directory. So modules, my module, lib. Dribble, plugin, block, et cetera, et cetera. It just goes on forever. So yeah, that's PSR0 in a nut. Uh, so next, annotations. Um, all annotations are is metadata that's inside of a doc block. And there's a distinction between an actual comment and a doc block. Uh, comments, you'll see them. Here's a single line comment. Again, I apologize if that's too small, but that's two uh, forward slashes will make a single line comment, and then you have a forward slash and an asterisk that would make a multi-line comment. So those are comments, and those are actually ignored by opcache. But a doc block, which you probably have already seen many times, is cached by opcache. Um, so that means it has some sort of a functional component to it. And it's not necessarily PHP code, but it's just it's like you're declaring certain values. You're defining an array of items, or you're just declaring a name, putting a description, or at least saying like where classes are. So it's very simple uh, value, or, or name value, or key value, I should say. Um, structure here. Um, and that's all that annotations are. Um, you will see the at symbol, which is a marker for saying, hey, this is a thing to pay attention to. Uh, one you've probably seen before is uh, at deprecated. Um, you've also seen at param, at return. These are all different markers. Uh, but what we're doing with annotations is we're just repurposing those markers to say, hey, you can read this. So have some sort of a parser, which we use the doctrine annotation reader. It reads through these doc types, and it can find metadata out of it and store that in a cache or something. And this is how class implementations can have their metadata baked in together without having to have that dis disconnect anymore. So again, that's all the annotations are, metadata inside of the doc blocks. Um, dependency injection, um, this is a pretty funny one. Um, it's They call it inversion of control, uh, but really it takes code to really see what that means. Um, so assuming that you are defining a class, some class, and inside of the constructor, this class depends on another class called handler. And in the constructor, it's defining, or not defining, but it's actually instantiating the handler class. So it can be used within its own methods. Um, this works fine until the point where you need to override or extend that class because you need to change that handler. And this can be, uh, it's, a, it's a pain in the butt to try to do something like this uh, because now you have to override all the methods that reference creating or instantiating this handler class. What you can do instead is you could define the sum class and instead of instantiating the handler within the constructor, you can just pass in the handler object to the constructor. And so what happens is now the implementer of this class can define what handler they want to have and then they could instantiate the mic or sum class by passing in the handler to it. And that's what, what it means by inversion of control. The user that's using the class gets to choose which classes are used within the other class. The column. The column class, yeah. I need to find better words <laughs> to articulate this. But yeah, essentially, class instantiation happens outside of the scope of the, of the class, not inside of the scope. Um, and that's all that dependency injection is. Uh, and this leads to uh, service containers. Um, as you would imagine, uh, having to do all the instantiation of the dependent classes uh, could uh, become overwhelming. Uh, what service containers are, it auto-instantiates the service-oriented classes, uh, which basically means a class that is usable within a global scope, um, with all of its registered dependencies. So it assumes that if you're going to instantiate a class through a service container, at some point you've registered what your dependencies are. So mm -hmm. We'll look back at the example that I had prior, where you're instantiating a handler so you can pass it into the sum class. Um, so that works well. That's dependency injection. 
But let's say that somewhere else we are registering, and this is Drupal specific, not how service containers are used like in Symfony. But in Drupal, you have a uh, mymodule.services YAML file in which you can define what your dependencies are, and you're defining basically a service. So here I have services. My module sum class is what the name of the container is going to be. Um, I specify what the class namespace is, so it's under the namespace of Drupal, my module, namespace, some class, and I'm defining what the arguments are. Um, in this case, I'm putting in a, uh, an at handler, which is assuming that this handler name has been defined elsewhere, but it follows the same exact model, where it will define where the class is specified. And so the point with this is that now, instead of having to find the class names and instantiate them yourself and use like a, a use directive, you can just instantiate it by using Drupal service and then pass in the name of the service container that you have. So this line will do that for you automatically. And you'll see in Drupal 8 that there's a lot of dependency injection being used, and it could be, it could be really overwhelming of how many different classes you would have to instantiate on your own had it not be for the service containers that are available for you. So that's all the service containers are automating that, Drupal, uh, that dependency injection. So to me, it looks like you are defeating the purpose that you have this dependency injection because in this case, you are defining the handler class in the YML file, and in dependency injection, you are supposed to pass an interface mm -hmm. to the function, and you are not doing that anymore. You are basically defining it in a separate place. That's right. So you are. How, how is so aren't you defeating the purpose of dependency injection? Yeah, you totally are if you just have that one. But you can register many different service containers that have different interfaces pertaining to whatever use case is. Because typically, when you override a class, it's not a runtime decision. It's like something that could be cached, right? So you can have different registered service containers that do ex exactly what you're describing. Okay. So you need to create multiple service containers. Exactly. Oh, okay. so, so what you have here in your code is just a generic word service. Would that be replaced by a particular service name? Uh, so within the method right here, uh, that is the method that's tied to the Drupal class. So that is what you'd have to type in. The only part uh, that would be custom your own would be what, what you see in yellow, that string. That's the name that I've given the service container, the one that's registered through the YAML file. Wait, so, so my module is the service container or some class is the service container? Uh, my module dot some class is the, the name of the service container. It has to be namespace, otherwise it'll be like namespace clashes. Okay, and so the instance it gets back is what? Is what kind of thing? It would be exactly what we have up there. It would do that part for you. So it's getting back something from a container. Uh, it is. It is. Is is literally doing that code up there in a separate file. You see, you might notice that there is um inside of the defaults directory a PHP folder, and it's actually a bunch of PHP code that's been regenerated. When it's looking at the YAML file, all every all the service containers that you've generated, it's turning that into actual PHP code, right? Okay. So there's actual PHP code that's implementing that top line for you. So it's literally doing that for you when you call that function. Okay, I'm still not clear on how to pick out the container versus the instance that's going to be provided by the container. Ah, okay. Um, so I'll talk. About, okay, the link at the bottom shows you how like the service container is supposed to function. And literally, a service container is just an array of uh, anonymous functions. Inside of those anonymous functions is where it's popping in that, that code itself. Where it pulls in the class is from itself. It's a recursive thing. Because the service container has reference to each one of the independent classes, the my or the sum class that I defined, and also the handler. So it can instantiate it all within itself. And inside of that anonymous function, it's pulling it from itself because it has its own like protected access to that class. It instantiates it one time, and it just passes it along by reference, or by property, rather. So yeah, um, the, the, the link underneath it, it, it describes exactly how service containers work, and so you have a better idea. But as far as actually implementing in Drupal 8, this is the only thing that you'd have to do. Anyway, Frankie, yeah, yeah. Um, I'll wait until you put the code to the exam. I'll just get a dot. Okay. All right, so uh, a quick review. Um, talk about what plugins are um, and uh, also why they're, uh, why they're important, what the benefits are. Um, and we talked a bit about the, the core concepts. Um, so essentially, that is all you need to prepare yourself for Drupal 8 module development. Uh, so we'll go into some demos right now. Um, Pop in over here. 
this out of the way. All right, cool. So I'm going to swipe this over and show you the directory structure of my module. OK, so this is a pilot module. Um, it's basically where I'm doing all of my, I guess, uh, trying out Drupal 8 stuff. And it's on GitHub. And there'll be a link available for you um, so you can check it out. But what I will be implementing here is a block. right? Um, previously in Drupal 7, you would have to implement a, a hook block info and hook block view and hook block whatever inside of the module file. Uh, you don't have to do that anymore. All you need to do is put in a file in the right place. And that place is under lib inside of the module directory, the fully qualified namespace since we're doing the whole PSR0. So that's going to be Drupal pilots plugin block. And then just throw in my class. I'm calling it snowman. That's all. Since we have this place in this particular file structure, uh, I have to make sure that my namespace is corresponding with that. So I have here, and I'll go ahead and uh, bump this up since I can control this. Bam, all right. Cool. So I'm putting in the namespace that uh, that is associated with the, the file path that I have. And here I have class snowman extends block base. And I'm just going to be undoing text so you can see what's, uh, what's, what's happening here. Uh, here, I am providing uh, some annotations. Basically, it's just a document block. But this part is important, so that way the annotation reader, whatever's going on and finding where all the plugins are, knows that, hey, this is pertaining to the block plugin. And I use that by using at block. And I'm defining what my ID is for this plugin. And I'm putting in an administrative label. And you can put in a couple other things, like a category or whatever the plugin type wants. Right? This is essentially the hook block info that you would have done, but it's all nested within the document block. I just missed that. You said cache type would also go in on this annotation. What's that? So if this is replacing hook block info. Yes. And so cache type would go in on the annotation. Oh, yeah, it totally could. Okay. Yes, it totally could. All right. Um, one uh, distinction as well, since uh, I'm using block, uh, block base here, um, but you know, as far as this class is concerned, it doesn't know where it is. I have to call it in by using the use uh, directive. Uh, so this lets autoloader pull it in for me. So now we have the context for it. That's just a requirement here. Uh, and that's why you see a lot of use directives inside of the PHP files in Drupal 8. Next snippet to this is uh, just implementing the build method. So I mentioned uh, that uh, all these plugins have an interface to it. Uh, build is one of those. And I'll go ahead and uh, pop this, uh, pop that file open. Block base. Oh, I don't have the entire project. I just have that one project. Yeah, it's not important. Yeah, we'll skip that part. Uh, so anyway, um, there's an interface to block base, and one of the methods is build. So build is a required thing to be uh, invoked within this plugin. And all I'm doing is returning uh, basically just a, a, a render array of some markup. And this markup is just saying has a little snowman on it. Oh, I have to do this. Here you are. Now I can. Now I can do this. So basically, I'm just popping in the snowman uh, character, Unicode character. And, uh, and that's the class. That's all I have to do. Um, I can probably pop into some of my servers. OK, we'll not do that. I've had to install Drupal 8 many times, because uh, sometimes it gets broken. Uh, all I was going to show you was uh, that this block now exists within the blocking listing page. But really, that detail is not too important. Um, all I need to know is uh, this code itself was all that is necessary to build a block. Um, so think of the contrast between what we used to do in Drupal 7, which is invoke a lot of uh, hooks just to do this one little functionality. So uh, next, I'll jump into uh, an image effect. And you know, this is a, uh... yeah, it's too bad. So um, in this image effect, I'll go ahead and uh, show you the uh, namespace for it. Uh, this is also within the library, Drupal, pilot, plugin, but now it's under image effect. 
Um, this is processing an image, and uh, I should probably reinstall Drupal to, to, to demo this, but basically it pulls in an image and it pixelizes it. And you can determine how many, you know, how, how thick you want the pixel uh, uh, blocks to be itself, whether you want to use advanced rendering for the, for the pixelization. Um, so uh, here's the code for it. Again, we're just defining our namespace that's associated with our file structure. Um, class pixel extends image effect base. Here I'm specifying that, hey, this also has configuration. So this plugin, this class, is implementing this interface. So you should expect some, uh, some, some methods in here like build form or you know, here's my configuration default or whatever. So here are my annotations. Basically, I'm defining, hey, this class is an image effect plugin. Here's the ID, label, description. And I'm using all my use directives because I'm calling out these uh, classes by name here. So I have to reference them there. So they're pulled in by autoloader. And then here, uh, because of the config uh, configurable image effect interface, I'm providing a get form method. So the plugin type system would know, hey, this plugin uh, implements this interface. So this has a configuration. Let's run through that avenue and provide some uh, some routers for that. Sorry, can I uh, back you up just for a second? Yes. Uh, can you go back up to the use directives again? Um, so you're you're extending uh, the image effect base. I see that the configurable, uh, the configurable image effect interface. Uh, inter image interface. Did you did you know that you needed that because you pulled it out of the, uh, the configurable? configurable image effect interface. Oh, as if I, um, so I noticed that when it wasn't there, wide screen. Okay. So that was a, apparently a requirement to pull it in. Um, I'm not exactly sure what the requirement is there as far as PHP goes. Okay. If the parent class already has that included, then it's fine. But if it doesn't, then that means I have to do it itself. So yeah, it's a caveat in there. Um, and that's, yeah, that's the thing that bugged me about doing this kind of development because I'm not always sure when I have to put in the namespace sometimes. So yeah, okay. that was there. Um, so here, um, my method get form, um, basically just sending in a form array. Uh, I also have a default configuration method that's providing the size and uh, whether or not it's Boolean value for advanced settings. And then uh, ultimately at the end, all I'm doing is the apply effect, which again is part of the interface for the image effect. This is the only thing that it expects to have as far as processing. And I'm passing it through image filter. Um, I'm grabbing the image context that I have because it's all the context that I have. I'm saying to use this filter, image filter pixelate, and passing in the configurations of how big I want these things to be pixelized and whether I'm going to use the advanced rendering method or not. So, yeah. And uh, so here's another image effect. It's inside the same directory, but the spin on this is that this plugin itself is not a singular plugin, but it also cues in to create all kinds of plugin derivatives meaning that I can have some sort of a way to figure out when to use this plugin over and over again based on a slightly different context based on configuration. So I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, here is my annotation block, so image effect, and I'm saying, hey, there's a derivative in here. Look for that class, and I'll show you that class in a second. And I'll go ahead and pull out all the code that's in here. Um, basically, I'm applying an effect. Um, and that effect is uh, image filter colorized, but I'm getting the configuration that I would pop into, like say for instance, if I'm gonna change the hue of this image, uh, what are my RGB values? I'm pulling that out from a, a, from a plugin definition, what essentially would have been inside of this, uh, this annotation, right? This itself is the plugin definition. Uh, with derivatives, I'm able to uh, derive different plugin types or, or plugins themselves that have those values inside their annotations. Um, so when it's constructing the list of plugins that are available, it's going to look at this derivative class, which is right here. And in a sense, get derivative definitions is just managing a, a kind of a for each loop, right? You typically see a for each loop inside of your hook info file to do something like this, but now that's actually abstracted into its own class. Um, and in here, I'm actually just pulling in a list of values from a function, but this could itself have been from like a, the database or it could have came from some sort of external service or whatever. It's just a list of, of colors that I'm using to manipulate uh, an image. And I'm just doing a for each for that. And I'm providing the values for the annotations that would have been within this plugin. So basically the, the definition of this plugin. So here's my label, colorize to 
the name of the color that's inside of that uh, the, the list of, uh, of effects that I have and then also what color is in my pulling in and that itself is an array value within uh, the, the, the colors that I provide from pilot colorized colors. Um, and so with this I'm able to now have three plugins or however many I have defined within this pilot colorized colors all coming from the same source plugin, this one plugin. So this one plugin is able to represent three or four or whatever many number of, of plugins that you have. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, my Drupal install is just widescreen, so I would have loved to show you that, um, but I'm not uh, because, uh, yeah, Drupal is not installed. Yeah. Um, any questions so far? Because if there is, that would give me some time to actually install Drupal again. Any questions? No questions. Ah, this will probably take way too long. Forget it. I mean, wait a minute. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, time's pressing. I better not. I have to go over a lot of other stuff. OK. Is, is the derivatives method there, um, is that by all through? Yeah, derivatives is uh, is used through. It it can be used uh, with with any plugin type. Okay. Um, the derivatives is actually a a decorator, which we'll get into when when I talk about the uh, the 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 uh, the internals of the plugin system. So, um, for now, this concludes the demo. Um, I should have installed Drupal beforehand, but yeah, for now, this concludes the demo with actually creating a plugin that extends an existing plugin type. So, um, to review this part. Basically, we're just putting in a file in a specific file structure and making sure that that plugin is within a specific namespace, so what I'm defining here. And the only thing you really need to pay attention to is either other plugins that are already implementing uh, this plugin type and see what methods they are providing in which you just extend that class if, it's an image, if there's a base class associated with it and then provide whatever methods uh, the interface is expecting. So, in a nut, that's every plugin that exists in Drupal. Can you just review what exactly a derivative is? Yeah, so a derivative is, you've probably done before a for each loop inside of an info hook, right? Um, yeah, so by doing an info, uh, a for each loop inside of the info hook, uh, you could essentially have the same effect here by using derivatives, uh, a derivative class uh, in this scope, whereas it's using the same base uh, plugin definition here. So it's going to use the same class, but other attributes uh, will spawn out of the derivative class, such as the label and the colors. Right? My derivative class is only appending a new label and a new uh, plugin definition for, for colors, and it's being used within, uh, this, within this one class. I'm trying to relate it to concepts from other Languages oh, this is this is a separate, yeah. It, it's not like object oriented specific. This is a, a Drupalism. Okay, so derivative implies to me that something is being derived from something else. So I'm not clear on which thing is being derived from what. Yeah, so right right here in the derivative class, we are defining a method, get derivative definition, and in here you can define how these things are derived. I'm just using a a, a, a function that has some simple values, uh, which just return an array, right? But this could have also came from the database, right? Uh, for instance, uh, one example that's used a lot is uh, all the different menus that you have in Drupal. Uh, say I wanted to have a block for every different menu that existed. I have a single class that implements the block that would put in some sort of a menu, but I have a derivative class that says, look through the database, find all the different menu types, get their name, and pop that in as if it was its own plugin. Right? But it's still using that one class to actually implement the plugin that, that it provides. Okay, so is it basically a descendant class, or is it a delegate? Or, uh... It's kind of like a copy-paste. Think of that. It's copying this implementation, or rather, this implementation, and it's, it's, it's pasting it into a different plugin type, presumably, but has slightly different properties to it. So does this all get generated into the PHP directory as actual code, basically based on stuff? No, no it's it, actually happening at runtime. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, it's at runtime. And the only thing that's really runtime is the collection of the plugin definitions, not necessarily as it's invoking this. So all the old uh, invoke, like, uh, hook calls that are just calling all of the uh, classes that have been derived off a particular base class, that there's a base class for hook. Is that how hooks work now with older things? Uh, so in, in this, so, so far we haven't discussed doing any kind of hooks at all. Okay. Uh, yeah, so the info hooks at this place, uh, at this point, have been replaced. But you will still have an opportunity to do some sort of an info, an info hook uh, alter, or a hook info alter. Um, and again, that is a sort of a sort of a decorator, and yeah, we'll get to that in a second. But there's no info hooks that are in place so far at this at this scope. All right, so that didn't work out. Um, okay, so here's here's the internals of the uh, plugin system, um, and there's four plugin components um, that need to be talked about: the plugin manager, uh, a discovery class, a factory class, and a mapper. Uh, those are four fundamental concepts within the entire plugin uh, system, um, and understanding this would, would get you really far. Uh, so first off, we'll talk about the discovery. Um, the job of the discovery is basically to go out into the Drupal code and find out where these plugins exist. Um, it doesn't care how those definitions are actually uh, represented, it just cares that it's looking for any kind of plugin. Um, then we also have a factory. Uh, in a factory, all it's doing is instantiating uh, a plugin. So its methods are create instance, and that's all it does. Uh, whereas the discovery, it's looking, well, it's it's implementing get definitions and get definition singular. Um, so that's the scope of what discovery is doing. And then the mapper uh, is actually something that could be skipped, assuming that you already knew exactly what class you wanted to call. But a mapper's job is to figure out what instance it should get. So there's use cases for this, and uh, I'll talk about what those are. And uh, ultimately, what a plugin manager does is it's implementing each one of these interfaces. So in a sense, a plugin manager is a mapper, is a discovery, and is a factory class of its own. But the thing is that the plugin manager itself doesn't implement these functions directly. What it does is it stores a reference of dedicated classes for discovery or dedicated classes for the factory and it kind of just delegates the task. So for instance, if I have a call on the manager for get definitions, really what's happening internally is it's saying this function, get my discovery object and then have it do the get definitions. And so that lets the manager figure out what kind of discovery method do I want to use and how many do I want to use. So we'll look at to the discovery classes. Um, these are the, 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 the base classes that are provided by Drupal. These are all different mechanisms for discovering uh, classes. Uh, we have a YAML discovery, which basically means it looks out for all the YAML files of a certain type that you request, and it pulls in definitions from that, because it's simple to just have a name, a label, a reference to a class coming from YAML. So you can do that. You could also use annotations, which is pretty much the, the predominant way of finding uh, classes within Drupal, which you've already seen through the doc blocks. Uh, you could have hook discovery. So instead of just uh, having these come from annotations, you can just still have a hook, whatever, info, um, and the, 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 the plugin system would still be able to retrieve those. And there's also a static discovery, which just means that you're, you're literally telling it where the plugins are. Um, and this is used for testing, but there's still some sort of clever uh, ways of, of using them within your own system. Um, where it's not discovering anything. You're literally just handing it which plugins are available to you. Uh, so here is an, uh, what it looks like to, I guess, instantiate uh, within the plugin manager that you're creating. Um, this would be for the annotation class discovery. Um, so I guess this is the part of the slides where I'll talk about what each one of those are. But So inside of the annotations, basically it's just the doc blocks that are on top of the classes. Um, and I should say, inside of the, uh, the annotation class discovery, uh, one of the requirements are first, uh, what namespace am I looking for? So you would give it the namespace, plugin, actions, if you wanted to collect all the uh, plugins for actions. Uh, you provide it the namespaces, which just say which are the available modules that are you know, enabled at the time. And uh, also, uh, the reference to Drupal core annotations actions is saying, what marker am I looking for? So I mentioned at deprecated, or you've seen at base, uh, or at block, or at image effects. Each one of those is a marker. Uh, the Drupal core annotation action is, uh, uh, is an implementation of defining your own marker. 
So for instance, if you had your own plugin type called a, a thermometer, uh, you can have an at thermometer uh, doc block marker. And that would be basically just extending the annotation plugin class itself. Uh, so that's what's required for the annotation class discovery. Um, hook discovery, as you'd expect, all it needs to know is what's the name of the hook. And internally, it's going to call the hook for that. So in this case, I'm passing in elements info. And what I'd expect it to invoke is hook elements info. Uh, the YAML discovery, all it needs to know is what's the name of the file that I'm looking for. In some cases, it's going to be localactions.yaml, or it could be routing.yaml, or whatever the case. Um, and all it needs to know is what are all the module directories that exist, so everything that's enabled at the time. And static discovery, you're just passing in directly what those uh, plugins are. So on top of the original discovery, you have something, a concept of decorator. And this is something you're probably already used to, the alter hooks, right? You already have a set list of plugin definitions or whatever kind of definitions, and you have another like function that's altering it. So there's a discovery class for that. Um, and also the derivatives is another way of decorating the existing uh, plugins that you have by finding all of its uh, derivatives and adding more stuff to that stack of plugins. Um, so I'll talk uh, about each one of those here. So derivative discovery, um, the only thing that these classes need to know is the existing uh, plugins uh, or yeah, the existing plugins that have been defined. So these are all definitions that I'm passing to it. And within those definitions, it will scan to see if there's a derivative uh, um, uh, ID in there, and it'll go ahead and find that class and figure out what derivatives exist there. Um, alter decorator, this works very similar to the info hook. It's basically going to call hook action info alter and pass in the definitions that you've already found and return whatever you get from there. So you still have access to alter hooks there. A process decorator would be, say, you've collected all the definitions, but you want to do a certain level of massaging to the data, and all you're defining is what callback is going to handle doing that massaging of data. So there's your your uh, uh, opportunity to do some processing. And uh, one that is interesting uh, is a cache decorator, uh, which basically is a proxy for implementing a cache within your plugin system. So you don't have to go out and fetch all the definitions all over again. The decorator will say, hey, first look at the cache. And if there's nothing in the cache, then go ahead and look through all the discovery definitions that can be found through annotations or hooks or whatever the case might be, and then cache that. So all the decorator is serving is basically a way of like a cache proxy. So yeah, that's the decorator there. So in a nut, those are the discovery. Um, it's just means of collecting the information. Uh, next we have factory classes, and there's a few of them here. Um, it's basically just doing the create instance. Um, and the thing that's interesting about this is that when you're creating an instance, there's only two possible things that you can do. First is invoke the class and then handle the arguments. So there's really not too much depth with extending a factory class. And what we have in the default factory is it's basically just calling in the plugin class that it finds within your plugin definition and passing in a set number of parameters or arguments to the plugin definitions. Every plugin by default will be accepting a configuration, its plugin ID, and a plugin definition. So that's the default standard. Um, an extension of, of the default factory would be a container factory. Just like I talked about service containers as an alternative method of just instantiating your classes, you can leverage the same power here by using the container factory. Um, so it's going to call um, essentially a method inside of the, the, the manager uh, to create the, the service container um, and just still pass in the same arguments. So the only derivation here would be how it's instantiating the class and it leaves the arguments intact. Uh, within the widget factory, um, the widget plugin type decided that I wanted to have different arguments passed into the plugin. So all it's doing here is passing in custom arguments. So it's it's figuring out uh, uh, the config field definitions is going to be the third argument, and then the config settings is going to be the, the fourth argument for that plugin. So if you want to do something custom like that for your plugin types, you can do it by copying essentially what the widget factory is doing. And uh, finally, we have the, reflect, uh, the Reflection Factory, which uh, does something very interesting. It's handling a dynamic, uh, I guess, argument setter for your class. It uses a Reflection class to introspect on the class that is the plugin, and it determines how many different parameters is used within its constructor. And it maps that with whatever configuration is being passed in to the factory class. And so it's dynamically adding in the plugins. And this is actually really useful for something like autocomplete, because if you ever implemented some sort of autocomplete functionality, you could have an n number of arguments being passed in to figure out what kind of autocomplete values you can be pulling in. So this is used with um, 
the uh, the relation module, or not the relation module, the reference module, the entity reference module within Drupal Core. So yeah. And uh, finally, the mapper classes. Uh, this is the last part. So um, I mentioned that you can you can skip this part because if you already know what class you're going to call, you can just go directly to the factory and say, hey, get me this class. But the idea with the mapper class is uh, for some instances where you don't necessarily know what plugin is appropriate for a certain processing. Um, so here's where it starts. Um, inside of the, uh, the method signature, all it's asking for is a set of options, and it's not asking for the name of the class. What it does internally is it takes that options class and it goes inside the logic for that mapper class and it figures out exactly what kind of method or what, sorry, what kind of plugin should be used for the certain context. So I'll give you an example. Uh, say you are processing a compressed file. Uh, the only context you have here is that the file name is like uh, archive.tar.gz and your, your mapper class is supposed to figure out what class is appropriate to untar this or unpackage this based on the file extension, it's going to say, oh, okay, I know, this is supposed to be a targz, so I'm going to use the plugin for targz, and then I'm going to pass that to the factory class. Right, so it's, it's basically, it's a wrapper to the, the, uh, the, the, factory, uh, uh, the factory class itself to create the instance. Uh, another example of this would be, say, for instance, you're doing a, a content negotiation for a REST server, right? Uh, a client says, give me this resource, like a user 5, but I accept content types application JSON, or I accept application XML, right? When the, the server receives that request, it needs to figure out what plugin is going to implement that serialization, and it uses that by finding the options, oh, it's, it's asking for application JSON, so I'm going to figure out what class is the one that implements the application JSON serializer, and it'll pass that to the factory. So that's a way of, with logic, figuring out what class is appropriate for whatever kind of context. In many cases, you don't need this, but there's some instances like the use cases I provided that you know you actually do. Uh, so yeah, that's uh, that's all the internals of the, the plugin system. And so with the remaining three minutes, um, I will <laughs> show you how to actually create a plugin manager of your own. Um, in this case, I'm creating a person plugin manager, which is extending the default plugin manager, which extends the plugin manager base, and all of those methods provide are just the, all, all the necessary logic to do the uh, the delegation that was mentioned earlier, where the plugin manager is really just calling a um, a dedicated class to do the discovery, to do the mapping, or to do the factory. Uh, so I'm going to reduce the size here, and I'm not going to walk through all the code, but Basically, we start off here with a plugin manager, and this plugin manager can be listed anywhere within your library. You define what namespace you want to use. My namespace is going to be Drupal by the plugin, and right here, I am extending the default plugin manager. Inside of the constructor, I'm saying for the discovery, I want to use annotations, and I also want to have a container derivative discovery decorator, meaning that I'm going to support any kind of derivatives. And then finally, for the factory, I'm just going to have the default container factory, and that's it. Uh, everything else as far as discovery and factory is now handled by those dedicated classes. I don't even have to extend those. Um, and I'm also providing an opportunity to alter whatever plugin definitions I find by, you know, calling pilot or hook pilot person info alter. Um, and I'm setting the cache backend uh, to, uh, well, here's going to be my, uh, my, my CID, my cache identifier, which is going to be uh, the, the language, uh, so English, and then pilot person plugins. Um, these helper functions itself is basically calling other discoveries internally, and it's setting the cache for me. And you can look at the default plugin manager to see exactly what it's doing, but it's abstracted in such a way that when you wanted to create your own plugin type, this is the only thing that you'd have to do. So as far as the actual plugins go, we have to define what kind of default properties that I would have. This is where I would extend the annotations. So there's something for this as well inside of my lib Drupal pilot, annotations, person. And the only thing I'm doing here is extending the plugin for annotations and so now you can find a marker just like this out in all the plugins that exist and the plugins that I'm looking for are the ones that say at 
person. The defaults that I'm expecting are an ID, a name, and an age, and I could provide some defaults to you here in case the plugin doesn't provide those, those, those values. So I'm always guaranteed to have those plugin definitions in place. So now that I have that plugin manager and the annotation, I can say, okay, in my plugin, here's my interface. I'm expecting each plugin to implement a get name, a get age, and a greeting that says hello world or whatever the case might be. And I apologize, this is a really stupid example. Um, but the interface is saying I require these methods. And I have a plugin base just for convenience that implements that interface and it's doing get name, it's grabbing it from the definition. Get age, it's grabbing that from the definition. Greeting, hello my name is, the name and then the age. So that is a base plugin. Um, and so yeah, that's a base plugin. Uh, so when you call something like I'll do some uh, pseudo code. Manager equals uh, Drupal service. And I, one thing I forgot to mention, my plugin manager is registered with the service containers. So if you look right here at the pilot services YAML, here is the name of my service container. I'm saying what class I need to instantiate. And as far as the arguments go, just look at the, 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 the parent that I have. So it's going to pull in all of its arguments, and I don't even have to define that. When I want to call that, right here with the uh, service container, I'm instantiating that plugin type. Now, if I wanted to create a user interface, and this is where you can get creative, I can do something like this, manager equal, oh, uh, let's say this, uh, plugins equal manager get definitions and just like that I can go ahead and do a form with the options where I can create a table listing of all the different plugins that exist right so that's how you would create an interface just by grabbing all the definitions and the life cycle of here is basically just pulling in it's instantiating all the discovery classes and grabbing all the YAML files or the annotations or the alter hooks whatever the case might be but at the very end of it I have an array full of all the plugin definitions now to actually use each plugin, say for instance uh, through this list of plugins, um, it had discovered, and here are my plugins for person, or my out persons. Uh, here I have two plugins for that person plugin. Uh, I'm not really doing anything within the class, but all I'm providing is uh, the plugin definitions, Bob, age 26, and then Dave, age 42, and he's overriding the greeting to say something different. Uh, since I now know through pulling in all the definitions, I now know exactly what name of the plugin ID is, I can do something like this. Manager get inst or create instance Bob. And so now I actually instantiated the plugin that I just created. So now, within the system, whatever it is that you des design, you can pull in this plugin uh, by just calling it out by name. Or if you had, you know, used the mapper itself, you can let that logic figure out what class to call in. And then at this point, I can do something like uh, plugin greeting, and it's going to go ahead and say hello world or whatever kind of operation you had, and that's it. So this could be wrapped around any kind of fancy user interface, um, and you totally could do that. But this is the bare bone minimum life cycle of what it is to have a manager type, instantiate it, and then call it. That's it. Um, so final thoughts. No time for final thoughts. Um, so thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.